Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Raju Pandya Lodge, Director for Communications and Public Affairs here at DFPRI. Thank you to all of you for joining us here on this beautiful day. Thank you for those of you who are joining us via live stream. And thank you for those of you who will be joining us in the days and weeks to come through the video. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you here on behalf of IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, to this special event to launch the book, Food Citizenship, Food System Advocates in an Era of Distrust, by Professor Ray Goldberg. We are extremely delighted to have the opportunity to launch the Washington launch of this book, and thank you for giving us that uh, tremendous honor. If I told you all about Professor Goldberg's accomplishments and properly introduced you, we would not have time for the rest of his own presentation and discussion. But there's so many different accomplishments. He's a giant in our field, and we're very, very lucky to have him here. A member of our audience has shared with us his very first book. So 60 plus years of work here in the room. Thank you very much for that. Professor Goldberg is Professor Emeritus of Agriculture and Business at the Harvard Business School. Together with John H. Davis, he developed the Agribusiness Program at the Harvard Business School in 1955. From 1970 to 1997, he was the Moffitt Professor of Agriculture and Business and head of the Agribusiness Program. Since 1997, as Emeritus Professor, he has chaired the Agribusiness Senior Management Seminars at the Harvard Business School. He is the author, editor, co-author of more than 20 books and over 110 articles on positioning firms and institutions in the global value-added food system. He has had more than 10,000 students over the years who have learned with him benefited from his expertise, and who have in turn shared and made a difference to the world that we are all in. We are delighted, again, as I mentioned, that he has agreed to hold to the Washington launch of his book. He tells me this is the first time he has traveled on a plane in the last three years. So we are very happy to have him here, particularly to travel down from Boston this morning and to go back up this evening. <laughs> Thank you really for doing that. I know it is going through travels. The way we have arranged this book launch is he and I will have a conversation, and then we will have three wonderful people who are profiled in the book, share their perspectives and insights and reflections with us all, and then we will open up for a discussion with you and with the online audience. And so without further ado, Professor Goldberg, let's have a conversation, and let me begin with my very first question. This book, Food Citizenship, Food System Advocates in an Era of Distrust, what inspired you to write this book, and why was it important for you to do this book at this time? Well, <clears throat> we uh, teach by the case method at Harvard, and when you do that, a case is about a person. And I felt that we didn't have a way of showing the world who these men and women are. It's important to write a book about the change of because at the end of the day, most people don't know anything about the private, public, not-for-profit leaders that are children. I wanted people to understand that the food system has changed from a transaction-oriented system to one of a collaboration. And these men and women from different parts of the food system with different priorities and different ways of attacking the problem wanted to do so in the spirit of responding to the needs of the food system and trying to improve nutrition and economic development in the global food system. I just felt that these men and women are not really known by the public, and I wanted this book to provide that knowledge. Hey, thank you very much. Your book subtitle is Era of Distrust. What do you mean by an era of distrust? What is the distrust you're talking about? Well, as the largest 
economic system in the world, the people who are served by that system, the ultimate consumers, are rightfully worried about how it's organized, how well they are being heard in terms of the nutrition they need, and they want to know everything about that food system as to where it's produced and how it's produced and how it makes a difference to both the environment and to the consumer and to the nutrition and economic development of society. Thank you very much, and I hope later on Caroline will be able to come back to you on the distrust issues also. But let me take a segue for a moment. You are the father of agribusiness. All of us know that. Will you tell us what agribusiness is? Where does it stand today? Well, agribusiness was developed by John Davis and myself back in 1955 because the business school wanted to train managers of the future but they wanted to train managers in the global food system. The uh, agricultural economics prof profession basically looked at it uh, in functional terms rather than in system terms. So with the help of Wasley Leontief and input-output economics, and with the help of MIT in systems analysis, we decided that we had to look at the food system as a system rather than as component parts. 60 years of agribusiness, a chance to learn more as we have the discussion with you later. Mm -hmm. So you have been in the field for over 60 years. What significant changes have you seen in the food systems and where do you see food systems evolving next? Well, the significant changes are based upon all the revolutions that have taken place in agriculture from the mechanical revolution to the scientific revolution, to uh, the genomic revolution, now to the microbe uh, revolution and the bacteria revolution. And every single change has forced people to look at the food system in a way that people never thought was possible. And they also finally realized that if we're going to have economic development, if we're going to have improved health, and we're going to tackle poverty, we've got to get the food system right. What's next? What's the next revolution? The next revolution, as far as I'm concerned, is the whole basis of looking at the single cells of the components of food so that you can actually create meat and other things without having an animal. That would be a huge revolution in terms of the use of land and the use of resources for protein purposes. So we're having a protein revolution, which I think will be the next major revolution. Many of us in the room are going to be paying attention to that and hopefully contributing to that revolution. You have earlier alluded to the big problems that are facing humanity, climate change, malnutrition, economic insecurity, and so forth. In the book, you say we must improve food systems operations. May I come back to why are food systems important and what is the cost of not taking action? Well, I don't want to be repetitious, but there is no system that looks at the private, public, and not-for-profit sectors all working together simultaneously in order to improve the environment, the health of the system, the health of the people, the planets, and the animals, except the food system. And that's where poverty and uh, malnutrition exists in the extreme. And if we don't attack that problem, and we still have a long way to go, but thanks to IFPRI and others, we're making progress. If we don't attack that problem, we will not be able to look ahead in the future and not really respond to the needs of society. So in an era of food citizenship, and you're sitting here at IFPRI, 
Of course, I have to ask you the question, what do you see as the big food policy dilemmas or big food policy issues or policy changes you'd like to see? The big policy issue, frankly, is the mistrust of science. And the policy is a good one in the sense that if you look at George Church, one of the great scientists of our time, he points out that we're just in its infancy and are trying to understand what that science can do in terms of using parts of pigs for human parts to not have to worry about accidents and people dying in order to take spare parts for the human beings. But he also looks at that as a way of improving how we grow things, how we use bacteria. But at the same time, he says the greatest problem, and I agree with him, is safety of all those changes. And what he says, and I agree with it, science has to spend as much time on the safety of these new inventions and new discoveries as they do on the science itself. So we continue for a moment on the IFPRI, food policy issues, food policy research. Where, what suggestions would you offer to IFPRI researchers and other researchers in this field? What is it that we don't know that we need to know? Well, I think IFPRI does a wonderful job in looking at the whole system, and I congratulate uh, one of our guests, John Ulan Wingo, on looking at the Congo and basically looking at the whole system in response to a whole nation. The last person who did that was Abraham Lincoln, so we've waited a long time for that approach. I, I think that from my point of view, I see a change in people moving from a transactional relationship up and down the food system to a collaboration and for me, that is the wave of the future. This book is about the people who've learned how to collaborate, and they've been able to do it in the PAPSAC meetings that we've had over the last 25 years. You mentioned, I mentioned rather, that over the last 60 years or so, you've had about 10,000 people as part of your classes. How have you seen leadership evolve over these years? And what are the key messages that you'd share with the emerging leaders? What would you like the emerging leaders to, to learn? Well, first, uh, the 10,000 really refers to the senior management seminars, not uh, the uh, uh, academic seminar. They were much smaller than the 200 people that come every year to that program. Um, I think that we are just learning how to respond to constructive critics like Mary and Nessel and uh, people like uh, Caroline Smith DeWall who acts, like, acts, acts us to respond to the scientific changes in a way that makes safety as important as everything else. I also think we're just learning how to collaborate. Uh, we have a broken system in dairy in China, and we're putting 10 or 15 firms and universities and cooperatives and uh, private and public instruments to try to change that system together, not as one particular company or one particular institution. I think we're just learning how to collaborate. We're just learning how to work with one another without, at the same time, making sure that we are not overly influencing the results of our research by trying to appeal to one group or another. If I may continue for a moment on the education theme, the world now is so much more interconnected and fast-moving information and the ways in which we are working and interacting. What advice would you have for the students of today in terms of how they collaborate across space, dimensions, sectors? 
I think the students of today are way ahead of the faculty and other people in learning how to collaborate with one another. They have been cross-registering from the medical school, the school of public health, the government school, the business school, uh, the medical schools, uh, the engineering schools, far faster than those of us who do the teaching. So as far as I'm concerned, the young people are leading the way. I believe our millennials will change our food system more than any other particular group of people in our history. I've never seen a brighter or more caring group of men and women, and these people are from all over the globe. They're not just from one nation, they're from multi-nations. I think that they want to uh, change the world, and they know how to change the food system far better than those of us who are older. In the end, everything is local. And uh, how can each of us make a biggest difference? And how can we drive real positive change? What would you have for all of us here? I think locally, people are demanding more from their local governments, their local authorities, their local schools. They are demanding that uh, school lunch programs actually improve the nutrition of our young people. The fact that more food is consumed through school lunches than then, and then is consumed not in school lunches. I think we're learning that if we're really caring about our population, we have to have a way of communicating that and using our young people. I also think that the gatekeepers, the medical community, have finally realized that nutrition is more important than popping pills, but they themselves need additional education in order to do that job. I believe we're all moving in that direction, and I am very excited and pleased and optimistic at my age to see that happen. Professor Goldberg, my last question to you, and then we'll, we'll go to our three speakers. What's the next book on? I'm not writing another book right now. I'm basically trying to write a history of the agribusiness program at Harvard so that my successors can build on that history and add to it and contribute to it. And I think that's my next job. And if I still live long enough, I would like to write a private history to my family. Thank you very much. I know that all of us will eagerly look forward to devouring this book, but also to learning more about how you set up the agribusiness program and what we can learn for it, from it as we go forward. Thank you so much. Please join me in appreciating. <laughs> so we will come back to you, unless you'd like to make a few more remarks. I want to say one thing more, that if there was any organization that was going to launch this book, I can't find a better, more thoughtful, more creative, more global, more successful organization than yours. So thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>